Sago, good afternoon. I'm pleased to welcome you to our first, engage, our first Nations Engagement on Federal access, Accessibility, um, our webinar. Uh, thank you for logging in and this, to this very important event. I'm your moderator. I'm Dr. Roselma McDonald. I'm from Akwazasne. Uh, the purpose of this webinar is to engage First Nations service providers, program delivery staff, and caretakers to inform the development of federal accessibility legislation. We are looking forward to the participation of First Nations nationally, regional organizations, PTOs, tribal councils, governments, individual First Nations, and First Nations persons with, with disabilities, caretakers, service organizations, advocacy groups, and mainstream persons with disabilities agencies. Uh, the, the Honorable Minister of Sports and Persons with Disabilities has been mandated by the Prime Minister Trudeau to lead an engagement process with provinces, territories, muni municipalities and stakeholders that will lead to the passage of a Canadians with Disabilities Act, now referred to as federal as accessibility legislation. Thematic areas for consideration include employment, procurement, service delivery, transport, transport the, the built environment in information and communications. Uh, the minister anticipates introducing a bill before the House of Commons by late 2017 or early 2018. The AFN has, was invited by ESDC, the Office of Disability Issues, to parallel the minister's process and develop proposal activities to advance a distinct First Nations engagement process with program deliverers, service providers, First Nations, and First Nations persons with disabilities, among others. The theme of our undertaking is empowering First Nations and First Nations people with disabilities um, regarding accessibility le legislation. What does accessible community mean to you? First Nations and work for workplaces benefit when everyone can participate equally in everyday life. There has been much progress in making our society more inclusive but we can do better. First Nations persons with disabilities face barriers that affect their ability to participate in daily activities that others take for granted. The Assembly of First Nations has received funding that to initiate an engagement process with First Nations persons with disabilities. First Nations leadership and other stakeholders to determine how such an accessibility legislation would benefit First Nations and how such legislation would result in a, in a more inclusive and accessible environment for First Nations persons with disabilities. The Government of Canada is seeking input on the following points. Feedback on the overall goal and approach, whom it should cover, what accessibility issues and barriers it should address, how it could be monitored and enforced, when and how, and, and how often should it be reviewed, how and when to report to First Nations on its implementation, and how to more generally raise accessibility awareness and support for First Nations in improving accessibility. The webinar seeks to have First Nations feedback on the following questions. Are you a First Nation person with accessibility needs or have positive examples to share? Are you a First Nation person with a disability? Uh, are you a service provider, program deliverer, special needs educator, or other? And do you know persons with difficulty in activities of daily living or, ha or have hearing loss, vision loss, mental wellness concerns, home and community care needs, or other? So our agenda for you today, for your, for your webinar, is broken down in two parts. The first part is a leadership panel, which we are sitting with here today. Uh, which includes a message from the National Chief Perry Bellegarde, and we also have the Director General James Ben Ralt uh, with the Office of Disabilities, and we have uh, beside me um, Elder uh, Chief Elmer Cushane with the AFN Elders Council, and on my left I have Chief Candace Paul of St. Mary's First Nation in New Brunswick, and a long-standing member of the AFN Women's Council, and we also have Trevor Augustine uh, to my far left. Uh, with the AFN Youth Council. Uh, the second part of the webinar is an ex experts panel which consists of Doreen Demas, a member of the Indigenous Persons with Disabilities Global Network and Indigenous Persons with Disabilities Caucus, uh, Wendell Nicholas, uh, chairperson of the Wabanaki Council on Disability, and Sherilyn Billy of the Shushwap uh, 
Nation and Program Director of the Aboriginal Skills Employment and Training Strategy, and Neil Belanger, Executive Director of the BC Aboriginal um, Network on Disability Society. So after each panel, there will be an opportunity for you to participate in a Q&A uh, by sending us questions about legislation that you would like the panel to respond to. There will be a break at about 2.45 when we will transition from the leadership panel to the expert panel. So let us begin with a welcoming message from the National Chief, Perry Bellegarde, which will be provided to you by video. I'm Perry Bellegarde, National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations. Today's webinar is on an important topic. Accessibility for First Nations persons with disabilities or First Nations persons with extraordinary abilities. Now this is a dialogue that's long overdue, but I'm encouraged that the work is now underway. We need to hear your thoughts and your ideas, and that's what today's webinar is all about. Your input and advice will help us improve accessibility to programs and services for our people, including those living in First Nations communities. On behalf of the Assembly of First Nations Executive, I want to take a moment to thank the Honourable Minister Carla Qualtro, the Minister of Sport and Persons with Disabilities, for her leadership in developing Canada's first federal accessibility legislation. Minister Qualtro is also leading the engagement process to gather input from Canadians with disabilities, their families, and the organizations that represent them. This is an opportunity to provide your feedback on the federal government's proposed themes. Employment, procurement, service delivery, transport, and the built environment. You can speak to any other themes that you feel need to be discussed. And it's clear that any new legislation needs to recognize that equality for persons with disabilities in Canada means equality for First Nations persons with disabilities. Our words and direction will help everyone understand the ways this proposed legislation could impact our people, our governments, and our communities. This is a fundamental human rights issue. Now Canada has committed to implementing the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. This declaration calls on all states to ensure continuing improvement of Indigenous peoples' social and economic conditions. It recognizes the rights and special needs of people with disabilities. The federal government also agreed to implement the 94 calls to action by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Disability issues are a consistent theme in the TRC's calls to action. Our work on this issue is an opportunity to invest in First Nations and First Nations persons with disabilities. The needs are great, but with proper support we can meet those needs. It's also important that we look at the jurisdictional issues. The issues of responsibility between the federal and provincial governments in providing services on reserve, and in particular, the application and full implementation of Jordan's principle. We need to work together to break down barriers facing our people with disabilities. We need to eliminate all forms of discrimination. And we must support the inherent and cultural rights of First Nations. First Nations have to be included in the development of any plans, any policies or laws that affect us. That means taking our rightful seat at the table and determining the solutions that work best for us. So thank you for taking this opportunity to put your best ideas forward. This is a chance to build better communities for all our people. Egose, ken nas kontinua. Ken nas kontinua. So I want to say thank you to the AFN National Chief's Office for this very strong welcome message. Um, I'm now going to go on to our second speaker, who is with the ESDC Office of Disability Issues, Director James, Director General James Ben Bolt. Thank you for that introduction, Dr. McDonald, and I want to thank you all for the opportunity to continue this important conversation on the development of federal uh, accessibility legislation. Uh, 
in my short remarks today, and they will be short because I'm looking forward to the question and answer um, session, um, I'll give you a little bit of overview of the process um, that we've undertaken so far in terms of consultations. Um, I'd like to highlight for you um, early indications of what we've been hearing as we've traveled across the country and um, provide some specific comments um, that we're receiving on an individual or collective basis <clears throat> regarding um, accessibility issues for Indigenous peoples across the country. I'd like to highlight that broadly speaking the goal of the federal accessibility legislation will be to eliminate systemic barriers in the areas of federal jurisdiction and to promote equal opportunities for all people living with disabilities or, or who may have functional limitations. As Dr. McDonald indicated, uh, Minister Qualtro was given a mandate, uh, an extensive mandate on consultation for the development of, of legislation. Um, and this nationwide process was launched uh, in June of last year. Uh, as of today, we've completed 18 public sessions in cities uh, across the country from uh, C to C to C, and 19 thematic roundtables. On November 1st, we also held an all-day youth forum here in Ottawa and had representation from Canada, including Indigenous youth from across the country. Finally, in addition to these in-person consultations, we've had over 3,000 people provide input to our online questionnaire, uh, which is scheduled to close at the end of February. So if you're interested, we'd encourage you to get that input in uh, over the next couple of days. <coughs> the breadth and the depth of the information and ideas and opportunities and challenges that have been identified is extraordinary. And with respect to accessibility issues raised by Indigenous peoples to date, we've heard about the specific challenges in the context of, one, higher rates of disabilities amongst dis, uh, Indigenous peoples. Two, the rural and remote locations of First Nations impacting on access to policies, programs, and services. And three, very different starting points for uh, accessibility within First Nations. We've also heard about programs, for example, the non-insured health benefits, with eligibility requirements that prevent Indigenous peoples with disability from accessing resources available to others. Excluding Indigenous accessibility in the planned legislation would widen the gap further from the most vulnerable persons with disabilities. And that this legislation will need to be coupled with a change in culture with a change in attitude, with a change in behavior. It's about recognizing that we, as a society, as peoples, have come to move beyond the conversation of the duty to accommodate to a conversation about inclusion. As you may be able to tell, uh, we have a big task ahead of us, and we look forward to your input and continuing the dialogue and the conversation with you today and in the months ahead. Thank you. Well, thank you, um, uh, especially for your insights into um, kind of the indigenous issues and also like uh, highlighting the parallel process. Um, I think that's very important that the audience knows that what we're doing is parallel to what's been done nationally. So I think that's a very important message. Thank you. Um, now we'll go to Elder uh, Elmer Crochane, who is chair of the AFN Elders Council. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this important discussion regarding First Nations engagement on federal accessible legislation. My name is Almer Kachan. I come from Tagging First Nation in Manitoba. And I'm a, I am the chair of the AFN Elders Council. Today I'm going to talk to you about an often under-resourced and overlooked perspective when it comes to First Nations persons with disability, and that this is the issue of disability among our First Nation elders and senior population. Currently, there's very little data on First Nation seniors. However, some research indicate that there are approximately 40,000 Indigenous people 65 or older, and this number is expected to rise by 2026. 20, 
By that time, the percentage of indigenous seniors is, is expected to rise to triple. First Nations seniors have higher trauma-related disabilities and higher rates of disability due to injuries or chronic disease. Today, many of our elders and seniors are residential school survivors who were forcibly removed from their families and as children and lived in residential schools. Tragically, many of them never lived to return to their families or communities. As a result, many seniors are inclined to visit a health care professional for their sy symptoms until they are seriously ill, simply because they are afraid of their diagnosis will mean that they will be sent away for care and never return. We see this engagement of accessibility legislation as an opportunity to address challenges for seniors living on reserve that include inadequate care, income insecurity, old age security, lack of disability support, lack of continuing care support, and options for long-term care. We know that many of our seniors are being sent away to live in long-term care facilities far from their loved ones to receive health services or palliative care of life care that is not culturally safe. This can doubly traumatize for seniors for the simple reason that many of them have gone through the experience of the residential school, re-victimizing a residential school survivor, survivor is unacceptable. Cumulative trauma related disabilities or post traumatic traumatic stress disorder is higher among First Nations than in mainstream society. And this is important issues need to be better addressed and inform this key development. Losing elders and seniors into distant care facilities can be devastating to our nation and culture. It can have the effect of stopping cultural trans transmission from the elders to the youth. This is just one example. We are seeking to inform this legislative development and to work with government to ensure that there are culturally safe facilities, structured day programs, and urgent care. First Nation seniors have a higher travel rate, have a higher related disabilities and higher rates of disability due to injury of last year. We are concerned about the, about the home care natural program, which is still using population statistics, statistics from 1997 for its funding formula and has seen virtually no funding increase since that time. There is two needs to change. This needs to change, especially a time when we are seeing the First Nation seniors population needs growing rap rapidly. Some provinces will not assist with home care on reserves, citing federal jurisdiction. There is a connection to Jordan's principle here. Jordan's principle is a child's first principle used in Canada to reserve jurisdictional disputes within and between governments regarding payment for government services provided to First Nations. However, First Nations recognize Jordan's principle, principle beyond that of just children. These jurisdictional issues impact First Nations seniors, and we are looking to address this issue so that no senior goes without proper care. Recently, the AFN created a task force on First Nations seniors and aging to examine a home and community care program to make recommendation on emerging seniors issues. We would like to ensure that the recommendations of this task force also serve to inform this key legislative development. First Nations seniors and elders are our cocums. <laughs>
and Mishums are historians, wisdom keepers, and they deserve the best possible care and to be among their loved ones and family. Thank you. Be good. Thank you, Omar. Thank you very much for um, highlighting the long-term care facilities and seniors' needs and supports that are required and, uh, and reminding us about non-insured health benefits and, and the very importance of our elders. So thank you very much. Um, our fourth speaker is Chief Candace Paul from the AFN Women's Council. Hui, good afternoon. My name is Candace Paul, and I'm the Chief of the St. Mary's First Nation in Fredericton, New Brunswick. I'm also a member of the Chiefs Committee on Health and a long-standing member of the AFN's Women's Council. <laughs> I'm very pleased to be here today, and I wish to acknowledge the Honorable Minister Carla Qualtro, my fellow panelists, and webinar delegates joining in from across the country. I want to begin by reflecting on Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's announcement in 2015 and the establishment of a gender-based cabinet. This caught the immediate attention, and it also caught the attention of the AFN's Women's Council. In 2009, the AFN's Women's Council developed a culturally sensitive sex and gender balance analysis framework and implementation plan that was supported by Chiefs in Assembly resolutions. From our perspective, when we use the term sex and gender balance analysis, SGBA, what we, what we are really saying is, first, gender balance is not new to First Nations. Second, SGBA is a tool to help restore the traditional balance between men and women, boys and girls, and those along the gender continuum that existed in our communities long before colonization. Third, this is a tool to shine a light on the social economic status of First Nations and address gender imbalances more accurately and in a targeted approach. Health Minister Jane Philippa recently addressed Parliament and recommended that SGBA, or Sex and Gender Lens, is essential to the Health Accord process, and Health Canada is bolstering their SGBA unit to demonstrate this. We also believe that this is an essential tool to guide and inform an intersectional lens on gender and disability throughout potential accessibility legislative developments. We also see this as an opportunity to work with our federal partners in securing the necessary resources to advance a culturally sensitive SGBA lens on all of the work that AFN does. Equally important is the application of an inclusion lens on legislative developments, particularly when it comes to addressing the root causes of social and economic exclusion of First Nations persons with disabilities, namely the application of determinants of health lens. Furthermore, we must work together to uplift the most vulnerable members of our communities that of First Nation women and girls with disabilities. <coughs> Though people living with disabilities face discrimination on many levels, this discrimination is compounded if you are a First, if you are a First Nations person living with a disability and further compounded if you are a First Nations woman or girl living with disabilities. What is, what is an unfortunate is that we do not have sufficient data or know enough about the lives of our women and girls living with disabilities in First Nations. We need to change this. First Nation women and girls with disabilities have diverse experiences and face significant gaps in health services and social supports. These gaps are often linked to the issue of violence against First Nation women and girls. And that is why we are working equally hard with our federal partners to address this serious issue. Though there is so much more to be said on issues facing First Nation women and girls with disabilities, 
We also want to hear from our webinar delegates and we invite you to fill out the online survey at www.afn.ca. Thank you and I look forward to working together to build a more inclusive and accessible communities for First Nation women and girls and for all of us. Will Ewan. Thank you, Candice. Um, thank you so much for reminding us about the barriers of First Nations persons with disabilities, but even more so compounded for women First Nations persons with disabilities. Thank you. Um, so our fifth speaker is um, Trevor Augustine from the AFN Youth Council. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Trevor Augustine. I am from the Metabinagia First Nation. I am Nigma. I am the male representative for New Brunswick and PEI on the Assembly of First Nations National Youth Council. I am pleased to be part of this effort to better support people with disabilities leading to new federal legislation. Access and inclusiveness are certainly important. We know that a feeling of belonging is necessary for mental wellness. As you are most likely aware, First Nations youth under the age of 25 make up to close to 50% of the overall First Nations population. Within that segment of the population, there is a significant number of First Nations youth with disabilities. What kind of options are there for these youth to feel included and supported? That is something that the AFN Youth Council would like to get a better sense of in order to be better advocates for them. Over the past year, the AFN National Youth Council has been talking to youth on the ground, talking to leadership, and talking to the federal government on numerous topics, but in particular about mental wellness in our nations. One thing we encountered with the mental wellness crisis across the country is that youth are searching for more options that give them hope. Right now, there are too few options available. We have heard a number of responses from youth aimed at creating hopeful paths forward. Uh, we believe that employment is a valuable tool along the developing key skills needed for a variety of employment opportunities. Employment and skills training can serve to uplift youth by providing them with a positive sense of themselves as well as the means to support themselves and their families. However, from the perspective of a First Nations youth with a disability, we know that these changes uh, need to be made to access employment, training, and other opportunities to secure meaningful employment. Beyond employment and training, we must work together to break down the barriers and address the gaps so that First Nations youth with disabilities can fully participate in their communities. I am happy that I'm participating on this panel today, and I look forward to hearing from First Nations youth on this opportunity before us, and to encourage you to go online and complete the survey link to this work at www.afn.ca. It is my commitment that in my role as a representative of the AFN National Youth Council, I will look to engage more with youth with disabilities. I thank you for taking the time to join us today and thank the organizers for the opportunity to be part of this panel. <coughs> thank you, Trevor. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And especially, I think it's important for us to remember the significant numbers of the youth population in First Nations across the country. Um, as you mentioned, it's 50% of the population, and there's uh, significant numbers of uh, First Nations youth with disabilities, uh, uh, especially in the long-term care. So thank you for your presentation. You. So everyone, um, for, the, for those of you watching out, us out there, this is the first time that we've done something like this. And there's a lot of things going on in the room here. Uh, we have sign language on each side of us, English and French. We have translators uh, in English and French. And um, we also have uh, uh, accessibility uh, on the website. So I think that you know this is a first for us to kind of uh, meet the needs of persons with disabilities in a webinar like this. So I think it's very historic and very exciting. So now, as the as as your as our audience, you have the opportunity to hear questions from. We have the opportunity to hear questions from you, and that's why our presentations, by the way, were so short because uh, we only have two and a half hours and we, we want to hear from you. So um, 
if I have this right, uh, on your screen, you should see a, a chat box and you'll be able to type questions to us. And I don't know if we've received any questions yet. Um, and we have 40 minutes uh, of questions that we will have time to take. Uh, so I'm going to ask my colleagues behind the cameras if we have any questions yet. Marie. OK. <laughs> Okay, so one minute. We have one minute. So James, maybe you can, while we're waiting, if you can tell us some more about what you heard nationally uh, in, in your parallel uh, engagements, uh, as particularly uh, related to Indigenous. Because I know you did mention some, but I know yeah. there's... Well, I think maybe I can share a, a little story in terms of, um, you know, <clears throat> a moment uh, for uh, both myself and I think Minister Qualtro, the, the first stop that we made on the tour, um, and, and I think that the cross-country experience has been very helpful in terms of being exposed to many different ideas and many different perspectives. Um, but while we were in Whitehorse, we had an opportunity to meet with um, representatives of um, the treaty holders uh, in, in that um, part of, of, uh, of the world. And um, it, it, was, it, it was an important discussion because, again, we talked about access to um, health services. We talked about access to um, different benefits and different programs. But, but the, the real life examples, I think, are what make the consultation come alive. And so a story was shared um, um, from representatives in one of the most northern communities um, that we have in um, in the Yukon, and uh, about um, an elder who uses a wheelchair and uh, wanted to travel south, somewhere in British Columbia, to visit friends and family. And uh, that rural community had an airstrip, and an airplane, small airplane, can probably fly in and fly out of that. Um, of that community. However, there was no accessible ramp to provide access to the airplane. And so that elder and that community was forced to um, use um, resources for what should be for evac or evacuation under medical necessary circumstances so that elder could actually leave their community and go visit family and friends. And, and that's, a very, that's a very concrete example, a very concrete story about a, a very, it's a very simple story, but it's a very, um, you know, everybody can picture this story about, you know, wanting to go visit family and friends, wanting to get on that plane, wanting to make that trip. And there's a piece of equipment a simple piece of equipment missing from that community, missing from that airstrip, so that that elder, with whom we want to treat with respect and dignity, they, they face that barrier. And instead, we medevac them out of their community mm -hmm. with all the bells and whistles that go with medical evacuation to, to send them south for that visit. So I think that, that crystallized in the mind for both myself and the minister um, from day one of the consultation process, um, just a tiny sliver of some of the issues we were going to be hearing about. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that story. Um, okay, so we have a question. Um, it says here, Willie's World Wellness Center asked, are, we are located on the Six Nations of the Grand um, are public buildings subject to the Ontario Access Disabilities Act legislation uh, for public buildings and commercial wheelchair vehicular transportation? Would you know the answer to that? I would. It. I and I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna try and avoid sounding like a lawyer because um, it gets into a bit of jurisdiction. So. The um, Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act covers. Um, what we call built environment under the jurisdiction of the province of Ontario. So both public and private buildings, um, so Ontario government buildings, 
um, Ontario Crown Corporation buildings, those would be public buildings. Um, Ontario parks or those public spaces, whether they're a municipal park or whether they're a provincial park or even a municipal playground. Um, and, and even within the private sector um, within Ontario would all be covered by that um, piece of provincial legislation. Oh. Part of what we're trying to do is be conscious of we're going to work on federal legislation and you, you don't want somebody who is moving from, and you will all understand this, from the area of federal jurisdiction into an area of provincial jurisdiction and be subject to different treatment. So again, we use a very, um, I, I use a very uh, explicit example um, that's related to um, the community in which I live, Ottawa, and, and I work across the river in another jurisdiction in Gatineau, Quebec. And you um, have examples where, again, let's take the transportation sector and provinces regulate transportation, the Government of Canada regulates transportation, federal transportation issues. So you want to make sure that a person with a disability can travel from Gatineau, Quebec, cross the river on a bus, go out to the airport, get on a plane, travel to anywhere else in Canada, get off that plane, go through that airport, get a city taxi, and make it to where they're visiting and be treated in the same way. And the challenge from an accessibility perspective is that person is subject to federal rules for the bus, their federal rules for the airport, federal rules for the plane. Say they land in Winnipeg, Manitoba, then it becomes provincial rules when they get outside the airport and it may even be municipal rules for that taxi and you're treated differently as a citizen and as a person with disability under different accessibility requirements and so we're very conscious and Minister Qualtro has started a conversation with her provincial and territorial colleagues about the need to be conscious about you know people when they travel or when they um, visit or when they um, go to buy something, it shouldn't really matter what the jurisdiction is. Um, we need to be thinking about how people are treated and, and how they're cared for. Thank you. We have another question. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Someone from Ottawa asked, can you tell me how First Nations will be engaged in the optional CRPD protocol discussion that has been announced? <laughs> so um, I'll give a little bit of background. Canada is a signatory to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, we uh, adopted that convention in 2010 and um, Attached to that convention is uh, another treaty called the Optional Protocol. And the Optional Protocol um, allows for um, citizens within countries to um, take complaints or concerns um, that um, of, of discrimination against, uh, you know, that in violation of the convention to uh, a committee within the United Nations. An important aspect of that um, optional protocol is that you must have gone through your systems of, um, of rights and the court systems within Canada before you go to the UN committee. When Canada signed on to the parent convention in 2010, we did not sign on to the optional protocol at that time. And we're Minister Qualtro and um, the former Minister Dion, 
who's now uh, our, our ambassador to, uh, to Germany, um, announced in December that Canada would get consideration to signing on to the optional protocol. So we have, um, we've launched a consultation process with the provinces and territories. They're implicated in all um, UN treaty or international treaty work. Um, and we've launched uh, a web uh, consultation process on the departmental um, website, seeking input from um, all Canadians with respect to um, considerations around Canada's um, signing on to this optional protocol treaty. So I can certainly share that, um, that website link um, with you and uh, organizers at the FN and would encourage anybody and everybody to to participate in that. Is that something you can tell us right now or later? In, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the link, okay. the, the <laughs> www link off the top of my head. Okay. We, we may be able to get that for you before I go. Okay, okay. thank you. Thanks. We have another question for you. Great. <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> Okay, so this is regarding access to information and available programs and funding, which seems to be an issue for First Nations community communities. What would you suggest to be the best way forward in terms of shared information? Can we read that again? Yes. Okay. So sure. I. Um, so access to information and available programs and funding seems to be an issue for First Nations communities. What would you suggest to be the best way forward in terms of sharing information? So I guess the, the question is like, people aren't really aware, aware of you know, some of the programs that are available and, and you know, what, what's some better ways to get information about services for persons with disabilities? I th I'm gonna th I'm gonna answer that in in two ways if if I may because I think um, I think there's a there's there's a general challenge in just the volume of information um, that's out there and the volume of not just information but the volume of different um, kinds of information and kinds <coughs> of programs and, and kinds of services out there. Um, and there's a lot of um, noise in terms of how do you filter, how do you find your way to, to that right information, to that, um, uh, that, that one program or service that, that may help you or, or, or find what you're seeking. So we're often challenged as public servants to figure out ourselves what is, what's the best way to get that information out there. We, try and use traditional channels around um, websites, um, social media. Um, we try and, and um, work with community organizations and maybe they help us do a, a bit of outreach. But I think, um, I don't think there's a silver bullet for um, answering this type of question because I don't think we have a very good example um, of what works um, and and the added challenge is um, we add new programs on a regular basis so we add to that noise we add to that um, you know bank of information out there um, and um, we make changes on a regular basis to how the programs work or you know um, we're moving in this direction with the program or, or this direction on a program. So I think, it is, um, I think it is a question of working with stakeholders and working with um, eligible recipients on a little bit of what works for them, um, maybe targeting both the, the message and the, um, and the methods in terms of, of how we try and communicate that information. But I do, I, I, you know, I admit there's, there's a lot of material and information out there um, that that people have to navigate. Well, we have that challenge at the community level. We have so I, I'm from Aquasasna, and we have some wonderful programs. I, I have challenges just figuring out how to do my banking sometimes. <laughs> like yeah. you know, some very simple 
you know, you think it's intuitive, you think it should be straightforward, and, and, and you come to this conclusion that this process, this information process, wasn't designed for me. Um, it may have been designed for the eight other people that live around me, and it works for them. So, you know, it, it's, it's um, I, I'm, I'm quite sympathetic because I think we all find ourselves trapped in it. Um, and then you add on that, that the challenges that persons with disabilities face, right? And so they don't necessarily um, have assistance in navigating. They don't necessarily have accessible um, or assistive devices even to help them um, navigate a website. Um, they don't even necessarily have material published in the language of their choice. So there, there are many added barriers that are up there, both from, a, from information from governments, but also information from businesses um, in, in, in their capacity to navigate and get the information that they're looking for. So I've got like about five more questions, so I'm going to keep on moving. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, there's a few, a few more for you. <laughs> so um, someone asked, I heard legislation spoke of, is this being introduced? And will there be new dollars specifically for our disabled this coming year? And how will they be regionally allocated? Mm. Mm. <laughs> uh, we're hoping, the minister's hoping, to table her legislation in late 2017, um, early 2018. Um, at this point in time, um, it's probably a little bit too early to talk about any funding requirements that would be associated with the legislation. Um, we are going to need some funding in terms of supporting the legislation and implementing the legislation. Um, and the ministers regularly um, talked about in public um, outside of the legislation as an instrument. Um, you know, the discussion on culture change, um, she's probably going to need to look at some programming to go along with that in terms of um, affecting that culture change. Um, but the, the, the very simple answer is it's, it's a little bit early in our process. I'm, there's a couple more questions for you, but I'm going to switch gears right. and, um, <laughs> and, yeah, and we'll get you some water. <laughs> um, okay, this question is for Chief Paul. Um, there has been much press about youth suicides. What the press doesn't discuss is the majority of these suicides need, seem to be young girls. Is this address is this addressed more within communities? Um, I guess I'll speak generally. Um, definitely, suicide, male or female, is a, a, a horrific um, trauma um, event that affects uh, not only the family, but the whole community. And um, uh, I, I believe that um, everything is done possible that to address, um, to provide counseling, to provide um, uh, information, to try to gather information so we can understand why. And sometimes you don't get the answers and that that's really difficult but um, um, I'm sure that there is a lot of um, uh, gatherings and meetings that um, that go on and to try to to address the the root cause of, uh, of what happened and what took place Thank you. okay James, it's on to you again. So, um, okay, uh, Jason asked, how long will it take to develop the federal legislation and for it to be implemented across Canada? Well, thank you for that question, Jason, and I'm sure um, my team who's probably watching the webinar will also be interested in my answer on that. Um, so the consultations uh, wrap up uh, at the Government of Canada level uh, at the end of this month, so next week. 
Um, and then we'll be, again, working with the minister in developing a, um, a what was said report um, that we're looking to release um, sometime in May of 2017. And then I think that will, um, that process and the development of that what was said report will also inform um, the policy development that goes behind um, the legislation. So um, we're starting to work on some of the aspects of the legislation now. Um, so if, if you were to count, say, from March 1st to um, maybe November, mid-November, um, we're looking at about eight months or nine months in terms of development of the legislation. The minister will have to have a conversation with her cabinet colleagues um, for them to all come to a consensus on the legislation. And then, as I said, um, we're looking at the minister introducing the legislation in the House of Commons in, in late um, 2017 or early 2018. So um, it's an aggressive timetable. Legislation's not easy. It will be complicated legislation in that it has to, it's a very horizontal piece of legislation in that um, it touches um, quite a few aspects of what the Government of Canada does. I've had a number of colleagues in different departments um, ask me, well, will your, will your legislation implicate my department? And I like to answer with, well, does your department interact with Canadians? And they say, yes. And then I say, well, then my legislation will touch you because it's a piece of legislation that is intended to touch and improve the lives of Canadians. Um, so that, that will mean a lot of work across uh, the whole of government um, to ensure that, uh, that we get that proposal right. So when the legislation is developed and there's a draft of it, like what happens? Is there, is there going to be an opportunity for engagement again in <clears throat> terms of... Well, so then the, the really exciting part um, is that then it goes through the legislative process within Parliament. So the minister will table the legislation in the House of Commons. We go through first reading. We go through second reading. It will be referred to a standing committee for study. I'm sure that standing committee within the House of Commons will want to hold consultations on the legislation and seek input and opinions on, on the legislation. Um, that standing committee reports back to the House of Commons um, in terms of you know, proposed <coughs> amendments or um, proceeding with the legislation as it stands. And then you um, have votes or third reading in the House of Commons to, to pass in the House of Commons. And then it goes over to the Senate and we go through the same steps uh, in the Senate. So including uh, a round of, of committee hearings um, from a Senate committee. So I think, I think you know, What's nice about the process is we've done a lot of upfront work to inform the development of the legislation. And then, and then parliamentarians take over and do their duty in terms of examining the legislation and, and, um, and uh, having effective debate um, and engaging again with uh, Canadians from across the country um, before we um, We'll, we'll see the, the passage of the legislation and there's no, that's, you know, as a public servant, that's a very exciting part of the democratic process in terms of, you know, we, we will see what happens. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, we have many questions coming in um, and uh, we have uh, uh, the AFN staff on the side that are kind of vetting the questions for us and kind of giving me advice as which which one of you uh, to give the questions to. So for those of you out there uh, in the audience, uh, we're doing our best. So and we will, you know, try to respond to as many questions that we get um, because we have allocated 40 minutes. And so uh, the, the clock is ticking. Mm -hmm. So OK, one more question for you, James. Um, Walter asked, um, will there be funding available to assist First Nations in making communities accessible? And if not, how will First Nations, particularly remote and isolated, be able to comply with any new legislation? 
I think that's a very important question for this process. I don't think we've heard a lot in our consultations, whether from Indigenous communities or whether from urban communities or whether from um, other communities about what they actually need to become an accessible community. So I think it would be very important um, for this process that's being led by the EFN to highlight and identify those issues. Um, I can't, I, uh, as a public servant within the Government of Canada, it's my job to give advice. Um, consultation processes are forms of input and, and ways of informing that advice. Um, it's Cabinet and, and the Minister of Finance and the Prime Minister that make decisions on funding, and then public servants implement um, that funding in partnership with um, with different stakeholders, um, but I do. I want to emphasize that I, 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 I'm not trying to dodge that answer. Um, I think it's actually important that your process make an attempt to answer that question for you. Thank you. I actually got a question for myself. Excellent. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Connie says, can someone describe the collaboration with the ESDC, AFN, Health, INAC, and other federal departments that work with First Nations in relation to the development of this legislation? So, you can maybe mention ESDC after, but in terms of um, this process, this webinar is the beginning of a process. And as I had mentioned in my opening remarks, um, you know, there is going to be a couple more webinars uh, uh, that will be at the same time as the AFN General Assembly and another one at the same time as the AFN Special Chiefs Assembly in December. So there'll be another one in July and another one in December and there'll be lots of people around at those particular meetings. So there will be a, an excellent opportunity for continued engagement. And there has been, you know, dialogues uh, with with uh, Indian Affairs or Indigenous Affairs and Health and of course you're here today you know so would you want to add anything to that in terms of the ESP? Oh, that was a great answer. Oh <laughs> okay. Um, Marie do we have any other questions? So um, what I'll say we're doing very well on time by the way um, we are at 227 and so we have about 10 more minutes uh, for questions, so if I, uh, if Marie has any more questions for us, okay, okay. So we have other questions coming in. So, as I was saying, I'll say to the audience again that this is a first for us, and well, it's not a first for me. I've done a webinar before. But it's a first in terms of um, the sign language and you know uh, and the you know the the persons with disability accessibility. I think that's it's very exciting for us, um, you know, because I think on your screens you can see the sign signers, and um, and then the, the the text along the bottom. So there's a lot going on, I, and I I, I want to commend AFN for that because and uh, you know and also to. ESDC for the funding um, because I think this is uh, historic and it's a it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, maybe Candace, actually, you might want to talk a little bit more in terms of um, the missing women and you know how how that's affecting uh, you know persons with disabilities and you know uh, what's being done um, and you know especially related to violence towards women. First Nations women? Well, definitely, you know, um, in my uh, speaking um, notes, I talked about um, the um, lack of resources that we have, the lack of data that is available. So that plays a big part on um, actually uh, uh, identifying the true numbers uh, on the uh, murdered and missing women. Um, but uh, uh, a lot of factors uh, play into that um, and um, you know definitely the uh, social determinants of health uh, it, it plays a big part in, in that role um, 
you know, um, I personally attended uh, both gatherings, and it was a very uh, an emotional um, um, gathering uh, for the families. And um, but it was a time to honor their um, their sisters, their daughters, and um, a time for the families to to be heard. And I think we need to ha uh, we need to have more of that, and not just only for the Indigenous <coughs> people, but I think all of Canada needs to hear from these families, uh, needs to hear of uh, these stories, and um, um, we need to be educating. We need to be talking about this very important subject in our schools um, to everyone. Um, it it it's a uh, it's a topic that needs to be addressed, and um, you know I want to thank the uh, the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau for um, you know for the work that he's doing on that file, and uh, but um, it needs to continue. Yes, uh, James. I I while we're waiting for a couple of more questions. Um, I, I just I wanted to acknowledge um, Trevor's remarks um, because they made me think about um, the journey we've been on um, so far in our process with youth. And I think um, what's been inspirational in our consultation process um, has been um, the ideas and the energy um, that have been generated by young people across the country and young people with disabilities. Because I think, without, without speaking for them, I, I do think they just, they really approach um, the elimination of barriers, um, collaboration, um, the, 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 the way that they face problem solving um, is just done in a very different way than my generation or other generations uh, around me. And so if I could make a pitch, um, and I'll have a follow-up conversation with Trevor, um, I, I would really encourage um, Indigenous youth with disabilities in this consultation process to participate and, and offer up their ideas and to collaborate on those ideas because I think um, they're the ones that are really moving the yardsticks. They're the ones that are really making a difference in their community. They look at barriers in a, in a really different way um, and, and look at the, at the ways of overcoming those barriers through technology, through social media, um, through partnership. It's just a really inspirational part of um, the consultation process um, that we've been on. And I know Minister Qualtro has found a lot of, of energy and a lot of ideas from that. And so I think the more that um, you can do to engage um, youth with disabilities, I, I think the better outcome you will have from your consultation process. Trevor, do you want to add uh, maybe anything uh, in addition to your comments and what's just been said in terms of you know, what the Youth Council sees uh, in pursuing you know, advocacy uh, for persons with disabilities? Yeah. Um, the Youth Council would like to work with people, well, youth, Indigenous youth with disabilities. Um, we're hoping that people will outreach to us, uh, either through the website or try to cont us, contact us personally. Uh, I think it would be a great way to work with youth to work on this legislation so that we can have the right voices heard. Kind of deal? Mm hmm. Thank you. Elmer, do you want to add an elder's perspective? Um, in I was wondering <laughs> when you were going to ask. <laughs> he was getting ready to poke me. Mm. <laughs> and poke me. <laughs> you know, we talk about disability. And disability is very hurting in many ways to families, to relations, and so forth. I come from Manitoba, and I've seen people that come in from the remote con communities, coming to Winnipeg for dialysis and so forth. And sometimes the weather is unpredictable. 
but sometimes they stay in or they're permanently stay in and they never go back. You know, it reminds you, like I said earlier, just like going back to the residential school, you go back home in a box. It's a sad way to say it, but that's the way it looks like. I think we need to find a better way to accommodate the elderly, especially in re remote communities in regard to disabilities. How can we improve the situation at home? How can we provide that service that's required without leaving home? Don't forget, these elders are old. Maybe a lot of them are, are disabled. You know, there's always the language barrier and there's many things that, that block. You know, when I, when I mentioned Jordan's principle, Jordan's principle not only touches the youth, it touches all of us in all aspects of life. How do we answer that question in true reality and balance responsibility for everyone? Governments have a, resp have, have a difficulty on this, you know? Everybody's trying to define how or what it is, but nobody has really came up, come up with a real entailed answer to it. So to me, are we, my question to ourselves, I guess, are we listening to the disability people or are we second guessing to what they need. I think we need to hear their voice and concern to what's best for them and to accomplish that. I think the legislation has to be very, very specific into that direction. Their voice is important. Their wishes is important. And we cannot eliminate that because, you know, to them, life is important. I could go on and on, but I'd yeah. like to stop there because I, I might, don't forget, I'm up in age here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and we have four more questions and we have about six more minutes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, thank you. Uh, okay, this, uh, this question is for Chief Paul. Uh, from Jean, how have the families of the murdered and missing women, many of whom probably probably lived with some sort of disability, been engaged in this le legislation process? Well, I, I want to um, uh, reassure you that this is the only the beginning. You know, we uh, uh, so we anticipate you know further steps uh, of this and uh, this very important engagement so um, uh, we definitely will uh, the AFN's Women's Council <coughs> with, uh, you know taking this into consideration and make sure that uh, every voice is heard thank you okay um, this is for James so this is from Dale Dale says, to get an RDSP, I have to pay my doctor money for the disability tax paper. Will legislation change that as I don't have a lot of money like others? Thank you, Dale. And just for people's understanding, Dale's talking about um, opening up a registered disability savings plan, um, which then has some matching um, incentives or benefits from the Government of Canada and it's registered disability savings plans or RDSPs are intended to um, encourage long-term financial security um, for people with disabilities. Um, eligibility for um, opening up a registered disability savings plan is based upon your eligibility for the disability tax credit, um, which is uh, an income tax credit um, and uh, the paperwork I think Dale is talking about is that um, uh, a health professional or a physician 
is required to provide an assessment um, and send that to the Canada Revenue Agency for um, the agency to determine eligibility for the tax credit. I sound like a really good bureaucrat. Don't I? I can do that. I can do all the steps. It sounds, it's like navigating and how do you find information about the program. Um, I don't, I, the legislation's not intended to cover issues like that, Dale, to be very honest with you. Um, however, um, m one of my other jobs outside of talking about the legislation is around the registered disability savings plans. Um, that is uh, a concern and I would argue a complaint that we hear about often. Um, we are in regular communication with the Canada Revenue Agency ab about this. The, the challenge for us is that um, medical doctors and charging fees by medical doctors um, is an ongoing conversation between the Government of Canada and the, and the provinces and territories around responsibilities for health care. So, um, my, it's a very important program, I, I call it my little program, um, is, is, um, is caught in, in part of those discussions. Um, but I, I thank you for asking that question and it is one that, that we are quite aware of um, and that creates a financial barrier to uh, a very important um, Government of Canada program. Thank you. And um, I think the next question is for you as well. Okay, Dominique has asked, how can you help First Nations people with disabilities across Canada when there are three accessibility laws in Ontario, Man Manitoba, and Quebec? <coughs> that's a great question. I, that, that's a great question because um, Nova Scotia's introduced accessibility legislation. Um, we, um, British Columbia's taken a different approach and they've um, adopted a whole of government accessibility agenda. Um, and we're hoping other provinces and territories um, will follow suit and, and will get um, more involved in, in the accessibility game. Um, but it, I, I spoke to this earlier. I think governments have to be very, very cognizant about those, those handoffs between jurisdiction. Um, I think um, Indigenous peoples are very cognizant of getting trapped um, in those discussions. And, and as I say, um, we, don't, we don't want to create more barriers by 13 or 14 different sets of accessibility rules. So um, the legislation um, and any, <coughs> excuse me, regulations or accessibility standard development is going to have to take that into account um, as we go forward. You, you have to put, you have to put the citizen at the center of the discussion around how this is all going to work. Okay, uh, another question from Jackie. Hi Jackie. Hi Jackie. Um, who will monitor the legislation and ensure compliance? <clears throat> Well, we'd like your opinion on that. That is one of the outstanding questions in the development of the legislation. So one of the, one of the key consensus points coming out of our consultation process is that the legislation will need teeth, um, that, it will, that, that it will have to be enforced um, and that um, there will need to be a way to actually enforce um, the rules. Um, there's many different options for that. Um, you could have auditors. Um, you could have, uh, at, at one end, a whole bunch of auditors going out and saying, you know, you're living up to the rules or you're not living up to the rules. Um, at the other end, you could have self-compliance reports where organizations or entities saying, yeah, we're doing a good job and we say we're doing a good job, so we're doing a good job. So um, again, our consultation process, that was one of the key questions, was about compliance and, and who should be in charge of that compliance. And I encourage um, everybody out there to, to give some thought to that. What are some good practices? What's working out there from a, a compliance and enforcement perspective? Um, at the same time, the minister's also cognizant about um, it's the carrot and stick discussion. So, you know, how do you actually encourage people to, to, 
to move the yardstick on accessibility so that we actually don't have to get out there with, with auditors or with reports and actually people being champions and being leaders on, on, on building an accessible Canada. Thank you. Um, we're getting the hook. Oh. <laughs> so, um, okay, in terms of our audience, uh, I want to say thank you for sending you us <clears throat> some very good questions. Very good questions. Very good questions. I want to thank the leadership panel. Good afternoon. Welcome back to our webinar audience. Um, we just finished our leadership panel and now we have uh, transitioned to our expert panel. And um, so for those of you that are just tuning in, the purpose of this webinar is to engage First Nations service providers, program delivery staff and care caretakers to inform the development of federal accessibility legislation. So I'm going to get right into it because again, uh, we're hoping to have uh, more engagement. Uh, we got several good questions um, before the break. So I'm going to uh, introduce our next speaker who is uh, Doreen Demas of the Indigenous Persons with Disabilities Global Network and Indigenous Persons with Disabilities Caucus. Thank you, Doreen. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this, I would say, historic webinar for Indigenous Persons with Disabilities in Canada. Um, as Dolly mentioned, my name is uh, Doreen Dimas. And before I begin, I would like to just uh, honor and um, mention or pay respect to the Algonquin people as this is their territorial, ancestral territorial lands we're holding this um, historic occasion on. So, um, so we're here this afternoon, we're here today uh, to begin an engagement process around whether or not the proposed federal accessibility legislation is good for First Nations persons with disabilities and First Nations generally. Is this a good fit? Is this something uh, that could bring about fundamental change for First Nations persons with disabilities in Canada? Regardless of how we proceed from here, one key principle that I feel is critically important and is needed uh, is to be mindful of the importance of the inclusion of First Nations persons with disabilities at all junctures of the engagement process. Uh, given the history of struggles and uh, barriers faced by First Nations persons with disabilities, it is clear that we need some kind of strategy or intervention to address these problems. Applying a rights-based framework to addressing the needs of First Nations persons with disabilities, in my opinion and belief, is fundamentally important. Applying a social model of disability too, uh, that identifies the systemic barriers, <coughs> negative attitudes, and exclusion by society is also critically important to whatever process that we, we as a First Nations persons undertake. Um, instead, let's proceed by respecting and celebrating our differences. Moving away from the medical model that views persons with disabilities as being sick or needing to be fixed. First Nations persons with disabilities including myself and those of us that are sitting on this panel this afternoon that have disabilities, desire to be independent, self-sufficient, and contributing members of our communities. First Nations persons with disabilities want to exercise uh, their rights to make their own decisions and the right to make mistakes and take risks just as other people do. First Nations persons with disabilities have the right to an education, the right to work, and the right to have a career, the right to marry and have children, and the right to be equal participa participation or having equal participation within their First Nation communities. First Nations persons with disabilities, I believe, can live independently and be self-sustaining if they are accorded the aids and devices they require, including, but not limited to, uh, to, the phys to physical access such as the ramps, 
and wheelchair accessible washrooms and doorways. Alternate formats of printed material such as, braille, such as the braille that I'm using here today for my presentation. And plain language format for those with intellectual disabilities. Sign language interpretation for those that are deaf. Flexibility for those suffering from episodic disabilities such as arthritis and uh, chronic uh, fatigue and pain issues and those living with mental health issues. These are but a few of the kinds of accommodations and the kinds of, I, I believe, things that need to be in place or need to be respected and honored in order for uh, a successful process. <coughs> Adherence to, um, pardon me, Adherence to the principles of universal design will address and ensure many of these barriers uh, would be eliminated. Given the concept of designing all products and the built environment to be accessible, uh, sorry, to be aesthetically pleasing, but, but usable to the greatest extent possible by everyone, regardless of their age, ability or status in life. In other words, if you create an environment that right from the beginning uh, works for everybody, later on you don't have to make any changes. First Nations persons with disabilities have legal protection through mechanisms such as the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the United Nations Declaration uh, of Indigenous Peoples, Constitutional Protection and Human Rights Codes, which are all important. And today, we are talking about an accessibility legislation that might give us further protection as First Nations persons with disabilities. There is much to consider as this process un unfolds, but I hope that I have been able to, in this brief moment, provide you with information to guide you and help you on this journey. Empowerment, I believe, for First Nations persons with disabilities is about the belief that there should be, quote unquote, nothing about us without us. Thank you. Thank you, Doreen. Um, I think that last line, nothing about us without us, is probably the most important thing um, that we need to remember as part of what we're doing here. And also, you mentioned about applying rights based, a rights based framework. Um, which is funda fundamentally important for the accessibility le legislation, as well as addressing systemic barriers uh, and exclusion in society for persons with disabilities. So thank you. Um, now I'm going to go on to our next speaker, who is Mr. Wendell Nicholas, and he's chairperson of the Wabanaki Council on Disability. Wendell. Good afternoon. No Wendell Nicholas Lewis. My name is Wendell Nicholas. And as was mentioned, I chair the Wabanagi Council on Disability. Our mandate is to advance the economic, social, and cultural, spiritual, civil, and political rights of Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, Pass, Maquoddy, and Penobscot persons with disabilities. I'm very pleased to contribute to this dialogue. It's a long time in coming that we need to engage our leadership into understanding the complex issues that our persons with disabilities live with at our community level. This morning, I wrote to my chiefs in the Atlantic and asked them and urged them to participate <coughs> in this dialogue in order that they may understand what this accessibility legislation is about. The rights of Indigenous persons with disabilities as Doreen correctly mentioned, are protected in both Canadian and international law. And for a number of us that have participated in these negotiations, it can be isolating, but it can also be very opening in understanding just how much our rights are present and are in front of us and that we, as Indigenous people with disabilities, must best understand how we argue for our rights. In 2008, the Canadian Human Rights Act was amended to suspend 
an exemption that allowed discrimination for people with disabilities on reserve. It also related to matrimonial real property. But what it has changed is the way that the rights of Indigenous people with disabilities are envisioned now in Canada. And as James had mentioned earlier, with Canada now making a commitment to the adoption of the optional protocol, this is a very serious area that we want to be fully engaged to ensure that we are protecting our rights. As also was mentioned in terms of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Persons, Indigenous Peoples, and the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, there are particular articles in the Declaration that speak to the situation of our women, young people, and persons with disabilities, and that we must take every opportunity to fully express what these rights are and argue what they are. Within the Convention, which again Canada has adopted, there is more work to do. And as part of this, these treaties, we, we see them as the recognition of our economic, social and cultural, sp uh, spiritual, civil and political rights. And I say them over and over again because I can tell you at our community level and sometimes in the halls of the bureaucracy, they are very hard conversations that people don't want to have. I'm grateful for one that Canada has made the step to implement these rights through established greater mechanisms to monitor and to both enforce. And as mentioned, we want to be a part of this. The Wabanagi Council on Disability is preparing a shadow report on Canada's reporting to the United Nations Committee on, on uh, United Nations uh, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Committee. This is to take place in Geneva in April. What is important about this exercise, and this was one of the questions that I asked our chiefs in my letter to them today, was to share the experiences of people in, in their communities that have encountered discrimination in accessing their citizenship programs and services. As Indigenous people with disabilities, we are the ones that breathe life into these treaties. We are the ones, when we build that understanding of what these documents, what these words mean, that they lift off the page in our given life. I want to thank the Assembly of First Nations for creating this opportunity for Indigenous persons with disabilities to share their views. Willie? Thank you, Wendell. Um, Wendell and I have, and Doreen actually have had the privilege to work together for a long time now on, on disability issues. And, and I think it's so important that, as Wendell said, you know, First Nations people with disabilities understand the issues the best, and they're the ones that need to be part of this engagement process. So thank you for that reminder, Wendell. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce our next speaker, who's Ms. Sherilyn Billy of the Shushwak Nation and Program Director of the Aboriginal Skills Employment and Training Strategy. Cheryl, Sherilyn? Wait, Lanclo Legislation, Sherilyn speaking. Um, I'm truly honored to uh, be sitting on a panel with distinguished speakers, uh, such as the ones that I'm sitting with today and the ones who were before me. I'd like to acknowledge the ancestors of this nation from where we sit, the Algonquin Nation, the Algonquin people. Um, uh, so I'd like to first say good, after good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad uh, you've invited me to participate in discussions regarding the accessibility legislation. Before I begin, let me tell you a bit about myself. Uh, as as um, Dolly mentioned, I'm a member of the Shishop Nation, 
I'm located in British Columbia and, uh, and I'm also a program director of the Aboriginal Skills Employment and Training Strategy uh, here and after referred to as ASETS. Um, it's a program funded by the Government of Canada. The focus of my presentation will be on the concerns we as the ASETS holders face when it comes to First Nations persons with disabilities and to share how we can work together to help raise awareness and promote change. Our assets is one of 57 First Nations ASETS holders across the country. First Nations persons with disabilities face difficulties in accessing employment. For those First Nations who are job ready, changing legislation cannot be the only answer. As an Aboriginal Skills Employment and Training holder in BC, several First Nations come in to access our services who are on a provincial disability. For the most part, they are seeking a top up to supplement their income, are generally only able to work a few hours per week, and require additional supports that we, as an ASETS holder, sadly are, are unable to provide. As an ASETS holder, the focus of our program is to support Aboriginal people who are job ready, gain full time employment, and gain full time employment. In reviewing the accessibility legislation, um, the focus of my discussion will center on how it will impact program criteria and be implemented on the ground. As an ASETS holder, we are conscious that our employment counselors are not qualified to make diagnosis nor work with clients with specific disabilities such as head injuries, physical disabilities, mental health issues and other concerns. When considering changing legislation, changing attitudes must involve also a review of the current programs established to support individuals seeking to access employment and increasing capacity to improve program delivery. Legislation will mean nothing if the employer does not want to hire a First Nations person with disabilities. It is our experience under the ASETS program that there's a large competition and also educational requirements for jobs. It is important for the federal government to consider in enacting and implementing legislation to actively engage those individuals who have a disability by providing additional and consider providing additional supports such as transportation, childcare, education and inf infrastructure to improve work sites. In a challenged economy, it is important to note to the government that employers are less accommodating. Current labour market information provided uh, for BC, uh, British Columbia, indicates that individuals with less than a high school diploma qualify for 4% of the jobs. Over the next 10 to 20 years, labour market, labor market research also shows that 42% of all Canadians are at risk of losing their jobs to automation which are entry-level jobs. In terms of the legislation, the federal government will need to increase funding to provide meaningful training for First Nations persons with disabilities to increase their chances of being employed. With future trends indicating that 78% of the positions will require a trades, diploma or degree, the reality is that legislation will require significant investment of resources and an understanding that not all First Nations persons with, with disabilities will be looking for full-time employment. Lastly, the current definition of disabilities will need to be broader to reflect and consider mental health issues. If we want people to come to work, we need to have supports to help people with the trauma that they have experienced. Programs need to be customized to suit the needs of the person rather than the funding. It is important to build on what exists. The idea of monitoring and enforcing legislation needs to consider what is working and what concerns exist. Accessibility will require the federal government to look at their own programs and determine how much additional funding they are willing to provide to improve marketing, engage with employers, and upgrade locations that currently exist. Let me leave you with the knowledge that there are several people who do not consider what they have to be a disability and we need to thank them for the lessons they have taught us today. Kukstam Yishchuk, thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, thank you for your very insightful presentation. I think, you know, one of the things that I heard that was kind of the most important was, you know, how important it is to change attitudes 
um, which is essential into <coughs> improving program delivery, but also active engagement with employers, which is, is an important piece as well. So thank you for those messages. Um, our, our, I'm pleased to introduce our final speaker for the day, who is Mr. Deal, Neil Belanger, Executive Director of the BC Aboriginal Network on Disability Society, and he's going to be joining us by phone. Yes. So, Neil, are you there? I am. Okay. So you're on. Thank you very much. As, uh, as was stated, my name is uh, Neil Belanger, and I am the Executive Director of the British Columbia Aboriginal Network on Disability Society, or BCANS. I am also a member of the Laxail clan uh, within the Kitsan First Nation. Uh, I'm very pleased to be able to present uh, by telephone today. Unfortunately, I couldn't be there in person uh, in the AFN's first accessibility webinar. And I would like to, to thank the AFN and to recognize Marie for organizing this very important event. So I'm just going to talk a bit about our organization and some of the work that we do. Um, BCANS uh, is an award-winning Indigenous disability organization, and we celebrated our 25th year of operation last year in 2006. We are the only standalone Indigenous disability organization of its type in Canada. So I'm sure we're all aware that the frequency of disability within the Indigenous population of Canada is twice that of the general population. First Nations communities are often faced with limited assistance when seeking appropriate and necessary supports regarding specific disability needs. And just a, just a side note, I'm, that picture up there, I'm way better looking in person. Limited and lack of information on available resources, uh, including the process and requirements to access, jurisdictional mandate issues, poverty, remoteness, lack of transportation, limited housing, inaccessible communities and buildings, and the high transition of social development and health employees are only a few of the barriers often experienced by our community. In order to assist in dealing with these barriers, BCANS provide disability-related services to indigenous individuals and families residing within British Columbia's 200 First Nations communities and to individuals residing in non-First Nations communities across BC. Uh, just a brief overview of some of the programs that we offer. Um, uh, Disability case management. Uh, disability case managers here work with clients and families on a one-to-one -one basis to address their specific service requests as it relates to disability, performing comprehensive intakes to identify programs and services that are available, and also to develop services to individual family. We also uh, provide uh, Indigenous registered disability saving uh, plan navigation services, and the RDSP navigation services are available to eligible Indigenous persons. Uh, living with a disability. Uh, the RDSP, as James had noted, is a savings plan specific for individuals living with disabilities who have their disability tax credit or child tax benefit. Neil, can you speak up? Neil? Oh, sorry. Uh, can you speak Hi. up? Because we're having a hard time to hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Proceed. Where did you lose me? Um, um, when you were talking about the barriers, like program availability. Oh, okay. Sorry about that, guys. Yeah, just speak up a little bit, and then we are limited for time, so um, just go from where you are. Okay. So uh, I was just talking about the Indigenous, uh, some of our services. We have case management services where our case managers work one-to-one -one with uh, individuals and families to uh, assist to uh, address their specific disability-related needs. Our Indigenous Registered Disability Savings Plan program. So again, as James noted, uh, the RDSP program is available for individuals and families uh, who are eligible for the disability tax credit and, or the child tax credit benefits uh, uh, to help save for their financial future. We also uh, perform the persons with disability adjudication. So we take applications from all of BC's 200 First Nations communities and adjudicate uh, disability benefit applications based upon federal government criteria. And we also work with indigenous, federal, and provincial governments uh, in order to ensure that the disability-related needs and priorities of First Nations communities and indigenous individuals and families living with disabilities are known and acted upon by governments. Um, this involvement includes us uh, sitting on a number of advisory committees to government, 
both federally and provincially, and a number of indigenous steering committees relating to disabilities. On an average, uh, on an annual basis, we maintain approximately 7,000 client files. Um, this federal accessibility consultation presents a unique opportunity for nations and their membership to inform government on policy issues that can impede the nation's ability in ensuring their members who live with disabilities and maximizing their social and economic inclusion, which is a right for everyone. Some policy areas that BCANS works in with government and be of, be of interest uh, for this and other consultations include housing, infrastructure, home and community care, age limit, limited proposal driven disability programs, disability specific funding, non-insured health benefits, transportation, uh, person with disability benefits, registered saving plans, and other. It, also, it should be also noted that on February 22nd, yesterday, the federal government announced the creation of a working group consisting of six federal ministers to examine relevant policies, laws, and operational practices in relation to Indigenous people and uh, Canada's obligation to them. It would be a positive and important step to have Minister Qualtro to have a seat at that table as well. Uh, in closing, uh, I would like to thank everyone for this opportunity to speak here today. This overview of PCAN and some of the areas of work in uh, was created to give a generic overview of our services and an illustration uh, of some of the priority areas we work. Each nation will have their own disability-related priorities, some of which will be commonly experienced, some will be unique. It is important that a comprehensive overview of the realities and the limitations of the current system be presented while highlighting the exceptional work performed by nations across Canada on a daily basis. Thank I you, encourage Neil. everyone to participate in this much-needed important dialogue. Thank, thank you, thank you. Neil. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Um, I have about 14 questions in front of me, so um, I'm going to move right along. Um, we now have an opportunity to hear uh, questions from our audience, and I have several here. Um, so I'm going to jump right into them because, and I'm also going to ask James to James to come back up and join us at the table, <laughs> so you get it back in the hot seat, James. Uh, okay, so the first question is from Roseanne. Uh, we are presently conducting a study on First Nations persons living with a disability to better understand their obstacles and, to, and needs to access employment in their communities or in urban areas. This is taking place in the Quebec region, and I was wondering if other surveys have been taking place in other provinces um, and another question is, when will the results of the ESDC's research be made public? So I guess it's a two-part question. So the first part, Wendell, you're going to answer Sure, that. yeah. Um, the uh, First Nations Information Governance Center has just completed uh, research employment and uh, <clears throat> explored uh, some questions around disability. Uh, it's uh, very uh, recent uh, that this work has been done. And uh, but I would uh, encourage uh, what's her name? Rosa. Roseanne. Roseanne. Yeah, and others to go to the FNIGC uh, website uh, to uh, seek out information uh, on that question of employment and disability. Excellent. Thank you, um, James. Do you want to answer the other mm -hmm. part of that? Um, it's our intention to publish uh, a what was said report uh, based on our consultation process and uh, we're looking at releasing that in May of 2017. Thank you. Okay, Louise asked, will the legislation deal with discrimination against people with disabilities and First Nation people with disability as we, vo as we face both being First Nation and being disabled? disabled, and that's for Doreen. Okay. Oh, sorry, repeat the question? Yeah, I think I, uh, let me try that again. Okay, Louise asked, will the legislation deal with discrimination against people with disabilities and First Nation people with a disability as we face both, being First Nation and being disabled? Right, thank you for the question. It's a good question, and what I would say to that is that I think that this legislation and certainly the way it impacts the way it impacts uh, First Nation persons with disabilities really has to be mindful of that of what I would call the double jeopardy that is faced by indigenous persons with disabilities because um, 
unlike other Canadians that have disabilities, we're dealing with, um, you know, the the discrimination of of indigeneity, but also the discrimination of being uh, persons with disabilities and. Some of us are further marginalized by uh, by our gender and by and so on. So, uh, it is my hope that, however this legislation unfolds, and however First Nations uh, in the end, uh, however they choose to be part of it, I believe that that has to be a consideration th throughout the legislation in some way, because right now. I think the recourses that we have oftentimes uh, are slow, they're long, they're processes that take a long time. And, I, I, and I, I think that the other point that I would make around uh, discrimination is that we have, as a, um, I think just as a society as a whole, that includes First Nations people, our leadership. We have, I, I believe, a collective agreement or collective uh, responsibility to to stop that kind of discrimination, to do things, to do whatever we have to do to make, to, to stop that discrimination, to take away. And if that means doing it through policies or through, um, you know, uh, uh, enforcement mechanisms, whatever that may be, I think we have to address it uh, and not be afraid to, um, you know, to address, talk about it or to have an engagement process around it. Thank you. Okay, this is uh, for James. Um, it's from Manitoba. If this legislation is the first step in getting inclusion into action, what are your thoughts on how it will be monitored and enforced? Well, I think I, um, I started to answer that question before the break, and, and um, it's a very good question, and, and one of the one of the key parts of our consultation process. So we are actually looking for input on that compliance and, and enforcement piece. And I would encourage people to um, look at best practices, look at what's working. Um, a lot of compliance and enforcement doesn't work. A lot of legislation out there has compliance measures in it and um, we don't use them. Um, so. Uh, lots of options around compliance and enforcement and, and would appreciate people's, um, people's feedback on that. Thank you. Okay, um, this one is for Wendell. Uh, Roger um, asked, um, Mr. Cushane spoke of the, of the aging of First Nations people and also of aging at home. My earlier question about the built environment relates to this. Removing architectural barriers in housing will help to promote and support aging in place for First Nations people. I hope that my question will be covered at some point. So. Okay. Um, yesterday I was in um, Mysticini and sat with an elder who um, in her very beautiful home this was her home for her husband and her, and it was not accessible in order that she could get out or that her friends could get in. And so um, I'm glad Elmer had talked about the question of age earlier. And in reality, the construction of homes in many of our communities across the country are designed split level or not designed with universal design in the first place. And this is in particular the reason that I've asked our chiefs in the Atlantic and I urge other leaders to take stock of what the discussion will be about as we move forward. The federal government will not respond to priorities in housing unless our leaders say so. So we need to work together to make sure that the design of homes in our communities are going to need, meet the needs of, of all of those people, including those that age. Thank you, Wendell. Um, this one is for Doreen. Uh, Sean asked, is there a standard accessibility assessment for First Nations communities? specifically where the effort is to make the homes and buildings accessible for those living with a physical disability. 
Is that something you could, or well, James? Oh. You know, I would answer it this way. If, if there is, I think it's probably um, something that is very individual to the community. Uh, because we know, for example, that uh, you know there are there are building codes and there are um, you know even legislation, say in pr provinces and in cities, that address things like standards around uh, making a, a you know a built uh, environment, uh, whether it's a house or a building, accessible. Um, what I think oftentimes is Wendell just alluded to is that we have in the past built things that don't meet people's needs, whether it's age-related or whether it's because people um, have a, a disability that um, limits them in terms of their mobility. So what I think I have seen in the years that I've worked in this area uh, is that so people have to end up having to fix pr the problem after the fact. And that's why when I talked about the principle of universal design earlier, that's why that's very, a really a, a critically important uh, principle because if we if we build it from the beginning so it works for everybody including persons with disabilities particularly uh, we don't have to change it later and maybe building split level houses isn't maybe the best way to build a house in, in a first nations community uh, that's how i would answer it thank you uh okay this is a good question i guess it's oh it's from amy why are there no resources for deaf First Nations, I guess, persons with disabilities? Okay, Wendell. Thank you, uh, Dolly. I think that um, in, in partly in answering this question has to do with understanding deaf culture. And unfortunately, um, and, and I can even talk about my own ignorance, but I believe that, you know, when we promote accessibility like we have with sign language interpretation here, when we include in our organizations politically and, as I say, to talk about their rights and engage them, we will hear more. And just as I say, you know, and people understanding what accessibility means, there would be no webinar if there were no lights in those sockets. There would be no discussion if everyone had to stand up for the entire session. People would say, where's my chair? Where's my lights? Yeah. This is what we talk about accessibility. And we need to meaningfully ask people who are deaf how they would like to be engaged. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Doreen, Charlie asked, what actions do you think could be taken at a federal level that would help reduce stigma and promote inclusion and mutual understanding? Another good question. And what I, how I would answer that, I believe, is that, as I think a few of us have said earlier, the idea of changing people's attitudes, people's thinking about disability is critically important because I believe, uh, and I probably will hold this belief you know, as long as I'm alive, is that I think that the more people understand or the more information people have and the more people are willing to make those changes, I think that, that the, in, the environment for people with disabilities will become easier, the burden of it will, be, will ease. Uh, and, but everybody has a collective responsibility to, to make to change that. Everybody has, I believe, a collective responsibility to make that effort to think differently, to think outside the box, uh, to look at pers people with disabilities as being people first. Uh, and in this case, it, if you're an Indigenous person, your disability should be secondary. Your disability should not be what. Um, it should not be what defines you. Instead, it should be uh, looking at, okay, this person has a disability, but if we provide sign language interpretation or uh, for someone like such as myself, if you provide alternate formats of materials, or if you have, you hold a conference or a meeting in a building that's physically accessible, i.e. level entrances, ramps, 
uh, wheelchair accessible bathrooms and so on, then really there's no barriers anymore and you don't have to do much. And so a lot of times I think people worry or they're concerned that, uh, you know, changing or doing making a, a conference or a situation accessible is costly. And I will say that sometimes it is costly. There are sometimes monies associated with it, but I think mostly, um, again, if we adhere to things like, as I keep saying, the principles of, of uh, universal design, where we start from the beginning making it accessible, then the, there is no problem later on. If we start looking at people with disabilities as human beings first, and just seeing the, the fact that we do things slightly differently because of our disabilities, and it, beyond that, that's all there is, then I think we need to change that. I think I often think about how off, how long it took indigenous people uh, in this country, and maybe we're still working at it, but we've come a long way in terms of changing people's thinking about indigenous people and we can do the same if we can do that we can also do the same thing for people with disabilities thank you doreen oh this is an interesting question from dominique she says would there be a job requirement that the that staff like employees would be required to learn sign language I can give a good example. In Ganawaga, just outside of Montreal, most of the first responders in their fire department have learned sign language in order that when they're responding to a home with a child perhaps or a family member that uh, is deaf, that they can be of assistance to them. I think just as, you know, it's required to ensure that our languages in Canada respect the contributions of the founding nations, that we have to have the conversation around sign language, our own indigenous sign languages as well. So I believe that, you know, this is an opportunity for us to begin to address these very real and serious issues. Thank you, Dolly. Thank you, Wendell. Um, okay, Matthew asks, what would be the best way to incorporate and include First Nations persons with disabilities in the assessment, planning, and decision-making process, I'm assuming, of the uh, accessibility legislation? Well, if I could uh, just, um, from the hat that I wore for many years, um, working in my community and uh, with the Assembly of First Nations in, in policy development. That good policy development is, is really uh, built upon um, the real pain that you see in the community. It's very easy to, to design policy here in Ottawa because you don't have to feel it. But you go to the community and you learn from those elders, you learn from those young people, you watch those children, you listen to those moms and dads that worry what's going to happen when they get too old to take care of their young one. So I believe that, you know, in designing this legislation, we're going to have to do things differently. In our territory, we hold talking circles, and I can tell you that they're not easy to do because of the strain that people come and share about their isolation, their poverty. But nevertheless, we've pressed my friend James over here to come to our region and to bring his colleagues, and hopefully the minister too, to hear from our people in our region. And perhaps we can share a bit about what they can look forward to in working with our people at the community level. Thank you, Dolly. Thank you, Wendell. Yeah. Okay, this is another question from Ross. What are the greatest barriers to accessibility for First Nations persons with disabilities on reserve? <clears throat> Um, I think that, again, um, 
I, I talked about the exemption that was a part of the Canadian Human Rights Act known as Section 67. So for quite a long time in terms of the life, lifespan of the Canadian Human Rights Act, it meant that those of us that grew up and lived on reserve with a disability could not sue our government, could not sue the federal government, could not sue the provincial government, who were allowed to discriminate against providing accessible citizenship homes, programs, and services. And that changed in 2008. So we still have incredible barriers in our communities. And I believe that, you know, hearing from people with disabilities that live there, and many that had to leave their community because there was no access for them. So I believe that a lot of these barriers are not only structural, not only having to do with a set of stairs, or that no one is going to listen to you if you are deaf. They get too frustrated doing notes back and forth. No one is going to carry you into the band office up a set of stairs or into the health center. So we have considerable structural issues, but a lot of them still remain as attitudinal. So we have a ways to go. Thank you. Thank you, Wendell. Um, this question is for Sherilyn. Um, in regard to, and this is from Richard, in regard to income assistance and employment services, what are some of the programs that you think should be applied to existing running platforms that would benefit and raise the quality of, quality of life for First Nations persons with disabilities? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, one of the things that uh, we talk about at our office actually is we'd, we'd love to do way more, but the problem is capacity. Uh, we don't have the capacity financially to train people to help more people who have disabilities and also capacity to provide the additional supports to people with disabilities should they require it. I think in terms of um, income assistance, um, we definitely need to take a, take a look at that or maybe find some key points that we can work on with the provinces to say, you know what, maybe we need to increase those levels so that uh, they have more than just, a, just getting income assistance but a better, higher quality standard of life and develop more confidence in who they are as individuals because they certainly contribute a lot to our society and I know that. Thank you. Neil, are you still there? I'm here. Okay, um, we have all of like 10 minutes, so I, I've got like three more questions, so I'm going to ask you to uh, respond very briefly. Um, how do you see meeting the needs of children with dis disabilities in the education system when the funding comes from two different sources, education and health, and the roles for, of, each are, of each provider are different? Well, I think it's consistent what, uh, with what the other panelists have said. Um, there's going to be uh, uh, more engagement uh, from both provincial and federal governments with First Nations communities to identify the needs uh, of children within the community. Uh, I know that's been in the news quite a bit. Uh, and ongoing dialogue. Uh, we need to see some improvement across the board um, and, and better connection in collaboration, not in a punitive or responsive manner, but in partnership to the needs of uh, First Nations kids with disabilities on reserve. Excellent, thank you. Um, and we are really um, close to going black, so I've got a uh, couple more questions in there for James. <laughs> so, Jolene asks, what are the statistics of Aboriginal children with autism in Ontario, and is the rate of autism increasing within the Aboriginal population as steadily as it is in the non-Aboriginal populations? and what proactive measures are being taken or can be taken to ensure Aboriginal children receive best practices regarding treatment for autism, especially in remote areas? Unfortunately, Jolene, I don't have uh, the answer to the questions. Um, and I think part of it speaks to the issue about a lack of data. Um, 
for children with disabilities, for indigenous people with disabilities, um, for um, families who have children with disabilities. Um, we've, um, we have a Canadian survey on disability, um, which is different than um, some of the um, um, survey instruments that are used uh, with Indigenous people. But unfortunately, that survey um, doesn't include um, anybody under the age of 15. So um, we have a, quite a bit of limitation on what we know about the experiences of people across the country um, when it comes to um, data for um, people with disabilities. Uh, okay, um, Dominique, for you, James, um, can you demonstrate uh, how, uh, let me see, can you demonstrate how come sign language considers non-human communication that isn't part of a system of human communi communications since there is no official language of American Sign Language in Canada? That makes sense. Well, I think the issue of inclusion and communication is very important for um, this consultation process um, and the development of the legislation. And certainly um, the deaf community across the country has been very present um, at every one of our public sessions. Um, we've been able to offer um, both American Sign Language and Langue de Signes Québécois um, at every one of those sessions. Um, and so have had, um, I think, a really good um, engagement as that community has come out to, to participate. There's been lots of calls for um, official language um, recognition. Um, there's a whole um, piece of legislation, the Official Languages Act, that governs that, and as I said, um, we have to take a look at all of that from a, from a policy perspective. Okay, so we have, uh, I think, eight minutes left. Mm -hmm. So we did actually, excellent. Thank you to the expert panel for you know um, all your contributions and, and everything that you've said today, and thank you for staying you know, for the whole webinar. Um, okay, so, um, okay, I have one more question. So, and uh, let me see, the question is why are there no deaf education, why is there no deaf education in Aboriginal education in Canada? Institutions, I would guess. Why, why there? are there no education, no deaf education opportunities in Aboriginal communities in Canada, I guess yeah. is the question. Well, um, there, there is, has been a constant struggle with education in our communities that, you know, has been at the heart of so many resolutions from our leaders, our educators, our parents, around the needs of children that are deaf in, in our communities. And with some folks that I work with in in northern Quebec, you know, um, trying to get access even to justice, to health, <coughs> employment, education is a struggle. And there is, like Elmer had talked about, the struggle between the federal and provincial authorities over who pays for what. I really don't care who pays for it. But if it's going to improve the life of that child with a disability, then let's just let's just do it. But we still live in an environment, and here it is, 2017. That legislatures and even our parliament and our government continues to roadblock and continues to isolate our children. And so, in fact, we've seen some improvements. In fact, there has been outreach through Health Canada and through Indigenous and Northern Affairs. But is it enough? I guess that is the big question. <laughs> 
So thank you. Thank you. And that concludes our Q&A. Um, so anyways, I want to thank um, my esteemed panel here and um, again, for you uh, staying. Oh, sorry. Jeez. And okay, so we are now at the conclusion of our webinar and I want to thank our leadership panel as well from earlier. Some of you are still here and um, for your valuable participation and to you at the audience for logging in with us to hear what we have to say and to share your very, very good questions and comments with us. Um, thank you to Marie Farley Henry and the AFN staff for coordination of this webinar and to our te technicians here behind the camera and our sign language and our interpreters. Um, you have, uh, as the audience, you have additional opportunities to provide comments and questions regarding the engagement process and how accessibility legislation would benefit First, be benefit First Nations. Um, uh, as I had mentioned earlier, the AFN is undertaking a number of additional activities to engage First Nations and First Nations persons with disabilities across the country. So there are various ways to, to, to get involved and stay involved. Uh, by, ter by participating in our upcoming webinars uh, through linkages at the AFN General Assembly in July and the AFN Special Chiefs Assembly in December. Also, please watch for activities that are posted on the AFN website at www.afn.ca. And you can also provide your comments by email, fax, or other accessible formats, or by the survey, which also is on the AFN website. So thank you, everyone for your particip participation in this historic event. This has been a learning experience for all of us. This is Canada's first attempt at federal accessibility legislation, and it has brought us together to look at a better world for persons with disabilities. So thank you all for participating in this historic undertaking. Good afternoon and have a great day.